define your ideal client. Who is your ideal client? What is the value proposition? What are their point points? And what are the services that you can map to offer them? If you just come out with an idea of a service and you don't even know who your client is or where to find them, you're not going to be successful. So put that right. foundational work in up front and it will pay off in the long term. Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Keynote Curators Podcast. I'm Seth Deckman, your Keynote Curator. Our guest today, Nicola Kastner, is on the road in Atlanta, but is based in Canada. Nicola, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me and apologies for a messy bed in the background. Oh, that's okay. I don't think that we're making history. I think we've had a couple of messy beds in the background on the podcast, but it gives kind of a raw realness to our podcast, which is what we're we're shooting for. So thanks again for joining us. I'm excited for our conversation. Me too. So Nicola, let's get right into the heart of the matter. I'd like you to just share a little bit of what right now most excites you that you're working on. Well, that's a that's a meaty loaded question. And I think I'm going to say there's a few ways that I could answer it, but I think I'm going to talk about what I'm doing on LinkedIn because I've, I've spent a lot of time creating content recently because I feel very passionate about evolving the conversation in our industry. There's been a lot of excitement since Time named their chief events officer role and, you know, it's big buzz in the industry, but that doesn't happen by just being a logistical event planner. You know, we have to think about the business of events versus the events business. And I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit. So I've, I believe in this industry. I'm passionate about this industry. I went to school for hospitality. I always wanted to be in events. And so, and I understand the power of events. And I also understand how hard everybody in our industry works. And so my personal mission is to change the thinking and change the dialogue a little bit to help others learn from my experiences about what really had a focus on that business of events and drive impact from what they're doing. And on LinkedIn, you're seeing that as a platform, as a vehicle, as an avenue for, uh, you know, sharing that passion. Yeah. Yeah. And, and educating others and creating conversation. I mean, I don't have all the answers, of course. If I did, I would be a bazillionaire and would the, the world, world hunger at the same time. But I'd, you know, I'd be on um, your podcast. Yeah, another another day. But yeah, I think we, to your point, sharing is caring. And I care about this industry and I care about helping others advance their careers by having the right conversations. And you have a large following. I mean, you have a ton of followers and you get a ton of engagement to use the language of any social media platform Nobody's the expert. Nobody has all the answers. And I think those that do, and there are some out there that say, I can get you this X, Y, Z with less work and less time and a hundred times, you know, the results or whatever it is that you're looking to produce. LinkedIn is a really fertile community and meeting professionals are active all over it. And you talk about the power of events. It seems like posts themselves are like mini micro micro events, right? Like they're like yep. nano events because some things can take off. I don't know even if I'm referring to viral, but it can generate a conversation. Uh, Talk a little absolutely. bit. Is, is that is that what you're looking to do? Yeah. Uh, yes, for sure. And to your point, mini events, events are bundles of activities. Events are bundles of moments. And every conversation is also a moment. So, you know, to LinkedIn is a really incredible platform to share thought leadership, to, to build my brand. I mean, let's be honest, I have yeah. a company and I want to yeah. build clients for my business, but I haven't developed any leads yet. So I guess it's not necessarily working that way, but it's really, I, I just feel very passionate about giving back and, and allowing yeah. the conversations to happen based on the content that I create. Yeah. We're going to move on from LinkedIn, but I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn myself. And That's how for- we met. Yeah, that's how we met. We're such a modern relationship, (laughs) Exactly. But I feel this way, you know, and I refer to, not in a denigrating way, because everybody is out there doing their level best, moving forward in the best way that they know how, their objectives, their aspirations. LinkedIn is a campfire in cyberspace, and it's the water cooler 
online. And it's the electric moments that happen in person, but in the digital format. So you get to work, you're in the elevator, you get to work, you're picking up a coffee on the sidewalk from the vendor or before you go into the building or you're in the parking lot or you're at an odd time having to run out to do a personal errand and you run into a colleague and you're able to have a a conversation. Those are electric moments, those campfires in cyberspace where we can meet and participate at whatever level we want. What you, you mentioned leads, right? And there are people I know who are getting leads consistently and generating business. And for that matter, specifically with what I do, speakers. Yep. And I don't know if I can track here. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the risk and make an, an analogy here, but it's like if you're learning how to ski and you're from Canada and there's a lot of snow up there, and I grew up in Colorado and I skied a ton, and you're a beginner or a novice, you have the equipment, you're on the mountain, you have the pass. And a ski instructor comes up to you and says, hey, I can teach you in 30 minutes how to, you know, get to the blues from the greens or from the blues to the blacks or whatever, right? You're already on the mountain. You already have an appetite. You're already kind of enrolled and registered into the skiing. And then somebody comes along. If you're on LinkedIn to learn about LinkedIn and to use LinkedIn to get better at LinkedIn, LinkedIn marketers are all over the place perfect for you. But if you're in the meeting space and you're trying to move forth your business, and we'll do a shameless plug here, why don't you give us your URL? It's actually very easy. My name, NicolaKastner.com. That's right, NicolaKastner.com. And you're looking to forward your initiatives, your ideas, your services, what you provide and produce, which is important. It's a little bit harder because people are coming on the LinkedIn it's not the ski mountain just to ski. It's the entire earth. Yep. And yep. so it's a needle in a haystack type of thing. And I think from my experience where we've gotten the most engagement is just provoking curiosity, yep. starting a conversation, inviting people to the campfire. And I don't know if we can take that idea in our conversation right now and you can kind of move it towards what you do with strategy what you do with events, what you do with marketing, and how you provoke and move initiatives and your clients' ideas forward through this vehicle, these amazing vehicles called events. Does does that, are you tracking that? No, absolutely. And I love all of the ski analogy because I am the novice. And if somebody, when I was on the ski hill, gave me an opportunity to become an expert in 30 minutes, I would like pay a lot of money. Right. Um, So totally following along. So, you know, just just to, to clarify, yes, leads are important. I want to generate business for my company. And we'll talk about, I'll answer the second part of your question. But that's not why I'm posting. Right. I am posting to change the dialogue around yep. an industry that has given me an incredible career that I'm very passionate about. So if one piece of information that I share with somebody can inspire them, then I've done my job. I've paid it forward. The course of my career was changed by a session. I took at an event many, many years ago. And so I've seen the power of what events and content and experiences can do. And so we're going to, we're going to come back to that session. Yeah. So I mean, events are incredibly powerful for so many reasons, business impact, personal impact as well. And as event organizers, it's important for us to find that right balance between what, you know, whether it's a brand or a media company, whatever it might be, what the organization is trying to achieve and what the individual needs and tries to is trying to achieve. And when we can marry the two of those, yeah. that's when ev- events drive impact and become incredibly powerful. So that's what I do is I work with my clients to A, figure out, are they doing the right events? Are they driving the right impact? Are they participating in the right way? That's one piece of it. And the other piece is if they're making a large investment, how are they making the magic happen? You know, you don't, if if you're at a trade show, let's just use that as an example. You can't just show up with a booth and some messaging on it and expect to drive business out of it, right? There there are things, there are tactics. So their strategy needs to lead tactics and each tactic needs to have a strategy and they all ladder up and drive impact. So that's what I work with my clients on. And- when when you're when you're 
looking at a client's needs and it's aspirational and then they've either limited resources or limited experience and the challenge is let's say not necessarily the resource they're willing to do the spend or willing to be creative or take a risk on on a cool idea or, or an idea that's maybe non-conventional let's say but you're we're not able we're, we the, the idea is is getting not getting full traction because we don't have buy in right and this would be more of a general idea in any business what what do you do as that consultative collaborator when when they're seemingly on board. The idea is aligned and consistent and makes sense conceptually, but it's not getting traction. It's a little um, yeah, ambiguous. Yeah, and, and it but, happens all the time. Yeah. It happened, and, I mean, to back up. It happened up, today? No, it didn't happen today. But, excuse me, but for context, I, I worked as, I was a global vice president of event marketing strategy at SAP before I started, restarted my consulting practice two years ago. And that was a huge organization that I was, you know, 110,000 global enterprise yeah. software company. And so trying to navigate even that internally as an employee to drive a strategy and gain buy-in for a strategy was a very, was very difficult. There was a lot of selling, quote unquote, internally yeah. on concepts and gaining alignment. But that's actually as painful as it was at the time, it's actually propelled me to be incredibly successful as a consultant because there is not one situation that my clients are in that I've not likely had to navigate in trying to get buy-in. So for me, I've lived, I've breathed, I've walked in their shoes. So I'm able to help them break down any silos, drive conversations forward. And I always lead with data. Data doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. Data is your most powerful story and it will it will drive the right conversations. We know, we hear this word impact so much, Nicola, and it yep. might be the word of the year this year. There are events called impact. There are services that have the word impact in them. And, you know, my whole thing is, not my whole thing is, but I focus and I really ground myself in impact that is as immediate as possible and has a lasting difference, makes yep. that lasting difference. And so that it has this durability, this duration over time. It's not just the hot, sexy thing of the moment, the trend, the mode, whatever it is. Yep. You were in a session that was an inflection point for your life, for your career. Tell us a little bit about that and how that is emblematic of the power of events. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when, when you talk about impact, right, impact, impact goes both ways. Impact is to the organization and to the individual at the events. And if you can't find the right balance between the two, impact's not, won't be driven. So for me, this particular session, I was at the MPI WEC conference in Toronto. It was early in my career, and it was a session on integrated event marketing. and. It was a double session. It was like almost half a day. I remember where I was sitting. I remember what I was wearing. I remember the handouts that they gave. And that, it literally was a light bulb moment for me that said, wow, events, while I get to travel the world, which if I'm honest, that's why I came into the industry, can really drive a business impact because I felt it myself, right? So if we can drive business impact, which was what Essentially, the content of the session was, but individually, I took that away to say, I can focus my career in this space and I can focus on driving business impact and create an amazing, amazing journey for myself, and which is what I've done. So that's what the session did for me. So that's, that's where I go back to the balance between what does the organization need to achieve? What's impact there? What does the individual need to achieve? And how do those two come together? And quite frankly, I believe content is a very critical component of that. Yeah, we don't go, yes, we go to events to meet other people. Yes, we go to events to have fun. Yes, we go to events to buy things, you know, and to have a great experience. But if we don't learn anything, if it doesn't deliver anything for us personally, the impact, will, the event won't drive impact. So trying to find how all those pieces fit together is just so critical. Content, that's another word, right? Creating content, content creator. We, we do that here. 
And with keynote speakers, content is king. It has to be first and foremost. It has to be front and center. There's a concern in the past there has been about content being canned or it's a one-note pony and the speaker does the same speech all the time. Today, it's more demanding. Speakers are more challenged. Clients are more demanding on what they're looking for. And the content has to be that much more tailored and that much more dialed into what the initiatives are, what the messaging is, what the mood of the moment is, and what people are really grappling with or what they're hungry for. When you're working with clients, Nicola, how do you, how do you calibrate and bring forth keynote speakers, panels, breakout sessions? What's your process or kind of your mindset when you go into that based on how, when you measure their need? Yeah. So we, you know, I always start with defining what success looks like from both the client perspective and then the individual attendee perspective. And then we think about content and I, content is, I, I don't like to say the word content is king because I don't know. I don't know what a better word. Nothing is, is. Where we don't live in a monarchy. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exa well, I'm Canadian. I do. But <laughs> that said, you know, content is critical. I always say it's like an empty picture frame. Doesn't matter how beautiful yeah. the frame is, it's what's inside that counts. Yeah. Same with an event. But that content has to drive it has impact and be, and in order to drive impact, it has to be relevant. That session talked to me and spoke to my heart because it was relevant. It was something that I literally could take away and say, oh my gosh, I can apply this to my job tomorrow. Right. That's impact, right? And there's studies, Freeman's ha Freeman has put out some really amazing research over the last few years where they do their trend surveys about what are people looking for from keynote speakers. Only 1% of people said they want celebrities. 1% right. because That's relevance right. and credibility right. matter. So understanding what your audience needs and how can you deliver relevance and credibility through your keynote speakers is really important. I mean, I I skip the celebrity keynotes. Yeah. I have no interest in them. Yeah, and and you, I, I've commented on your post. I've posted about this very topic. And look, th this is what I do. I have I've booked some really high name people, and you know, it's had some great results. I recently was with Manny Pacquiao in Hong Kong. He's from the Philippines. Eight eight titles in eight different weight classes, and for me. It was a big spend for the buyer. It, they were pulled towards the recommendation. But the critical piece for the value there was that the moderator really did their homework and really was able to make it relevant and connect it back to the audience and what they were dealing with and how it could relate. It is nice to get, lift the veil on somebody <laughs> well-known, particularly in a in a region in that part of the world that this guy is a massive, massive name and huge worldwide superstar, but that they were able to have a through line yep. in the conversation that was grounded in what their values were, what was relevant to them right now, and what they could leverage or take away and really utilize and, and have them provoke some thinking and some curiosity around yep. what could work for them in their life. It's not an easy task to do because yeah. as you know, Nicola, and it sounds like you're, you know, in a valid way, gun shy about it. And if it's not your jam, it's not your jam. But when you have bigger names, sometimes it's difficult to have it be malleable and it's their mm -hmm. way or the highway. Absolutely. So as the curator, I have to set that expectation up front. Oh, you want to go with this one? You get what you get. And they show up and, you know, there's no guardrails. You're just getting for the name. And it's interesting that post that you made is that the thinking behind it is we're going to bring in a big name because it's going to put butts in the seats, metaphorically speaking. Yeah. And we're finding that that's not, that's not the reality. That's not what the data is saying. And, I'd, and, and, and I'm glad to have that data finally because I've, it's something I've battled against my entire career. Come on, registration's down. Let's book Oprah. Right. <laughs> or why? I can watch her on TV. Like, I don't need right. to go to your event to watch Oprah. So to me, I think it bodes really well for somebody like you that's a partner with planners 
that can help them understand, okay, what are your objectives? Who are your audience? What are you trying to achieve? Who's the right speaker? Yeah. That's going to help you achieve yeah. that, right? It's a conversation. It's not like, hey, Seth, I want said name and it's a transactional deal. Right? You are cons- you are consultative yeah. to your customers the same way I'm consultative to mine to understand what are they trying to achieve and what are the best ways to do yeah. it. So rather than spending all the money on Oprah, well, that's, I'm picking on Oprah now, instead of instead of spending all that money on her, spend the money in other ways that will drive impact and get a really great speaker that that will 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 drive impact additionally for the customer. Right. Well, and it's like the chicken and the egg. It's so conventional or so obvious. Let's get this huge name, you know, Oprah. We'll continue yeah. to pick on Oprah. First of all, if you're going to get her to say yes, you better really open up several bank accounts to do it. Absolutely. But again, you're going to, the the responsiveness, she's got a full life. She's got production companies. She's being pulled in a million different directions. And you want to get approval on a photo or a social media post or the moderator's questions. And it might take weeks you know, things need to move forward. Yeah. The other hand, you always had these speakers that are surprises, but in the same breath, you need your clients to take, take a risk, a measured risk. That's why they bring in the consultants like me and you that can say, Hey, we can vouch for, and I can stand behind this person, even though they're not a name will deliver and hit the bullseye. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and think sometimes it doesn't have to be a big name either, right? To, to your point, you know, I'm, for example, going to, to London on tomorrow night, tomorrow night, I'm going to London. Oh, I need to get home and pet. Um, to, and I'm speaking at an event um, at a keynote in London because I am relevant to the audience that will be at the event. So, you know, I think my advice to people is to, to work and partner with, with, those that know the business and know what you're trying to achieve yeah. and, and ask them to make recommendations on who the right people are that yeah. will drive that impact you desire. And we're hearing impact and we're hearing a lot of relevance in our conversation, mm-hmm. those words. And, it, you know, your fellow compatriot, David Allison, who talks about values and is it is it relevant and not to continue to lean on LinkedIn, but what the heck, we opened the door. Mm-hmm. I did a post just this week and talked about relevance. And there's what works for meeting professionals, conference professional, conference planners, event planners, event marketers. And we have to put our own aesthetics and our own stigmas and our own tastes aside to serve the attendees, serve the mission and the objective of the meeting. Uh And that's part of being relevant with the content. Content is key, content is critical. Really? It's no different than picking food for your event because you like it. I mean, something random that nobody right. else that you even know likes, but you pick it because you like it. Right. It's, it's no different. Like we we have to walk a mile in our attendee's shoes. And as a, as event professionals, we have to think about, you know, once again, those outcomes that we're trying to drive for both our organizations and our attendees and make our selections based on those. We're going to shift gears a little bit here. I want to get into your, share with our listeners a little bit about, you know, you came from an enormous international organization to entrepreneur. Yes. And there's the idea and the concept, then there's the throw your hat into the, over the wall, into the ring, jump in the water, whatever metaphor. Now you're farther down the road from that moment. Yeah. What was that journey like? And put it in the context of, aspiring business owners or current entrepreneurs or small business owners, what were the breakdowns, the breakthroughs, things that looking back today that were lessons and that would make a difference and an impact for our, our listeners and viewers? Yeah, I know this could be hours. <laughs> this is a separate podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, for me, this is the second time that I ran a consulting company. So I learned a lot of lessons the first time around. And when you run your own business, you are your own IT, you are your own sales, you are your own worker bee, you are your own accountant, you, you financial, you know, and there are some tasks that you can offload, but, you know, I have to be generating revenue to offload to pay somebody that's right. else. Right? That's right. So that, That's um, a chicken and egg right there. That's 100%. And so I, you know, when I decided that I was going to do this, I mean, I was fortunate, you mentioned um, my background. 
SAP Global Marketing was a 3,500 person standalone company in SAP. It's a it's a big machine, yeah. and so that created a lot of opportunity for cl- for me to work with my former peers yeah. that were used to having me on speed dial to say, how do I optimize this event strategy? They could still do the same, especially in the environment as we were just coming out of the pandemic. Events were just coming back up. These people had now taken on CMO roles at smaller companies and were responsible for the whole event portfolio. And they said, let's not just bring it back the way that we did before. Let's think differently about this. So it created a lot of opportunity and out of the gate. And in fact, demand was huge at the beginning, which was was a lovely problem to have. But I also realized that, and it was actually through doing some research for my post when I was going to announce to my LinkedIn community that, that I had started my own consulting company. I'd already announced that I'd left SAP and said more to come later. And then I was so busy that I didn't have time to announce. I didn't have time to have a phone call. So when I announced it, I was doing research about the great resignation. And what was the impact of that on um, consultants and freelance talent? And I actually prefer to now call it the great realization because I think a lot of us that lived through the pandemic, especially in the events industry, it was not was a fun for anybody. But us in events, it was definitely not fun. Like, let's just learn a whole new discipline overnight. And I came across a biz, business coach, actually a, a podcast on how to grow your own consulting company. I landed up hiring that business coach so I didn't make the same mistakes. Mm. And really what I do, and I'm I'm not as structured at it as I'd like to be, sure. but that's just who I am as an individual. I have to divide my work into three chunks. I have to think about the work, client work. I have to think about the working in the business. So making sure that my financials are in line, that my bookkeeper has what she needs, that my taxes get filed. That, you know, I've got the right tech stack. Operational type of stuff. Exactly, to support me. And then I also have to think about business development. Now I'm a salesperson. Right. I'm an IT person and a finance person. That sales arm is the piece that I dislike, quite frankly, the most. And so it's the one that I have to force myself to put the most effort into to make sure that I keep that machine rolling. And, you know, it's it's not just it's hard sales and it. It's never that, but it's creating content. It is sharing opinions. It is participating in podcasts. It is speaking engagements and helping spread the word, A, to help impact our industry, but also to to bring awareness to, to myself. So it's been, it's been, it's different. It is, it's very, very rewarding. Sometimes it's very, very lonely too. You know, I miss being part of a team and being able to drive impact. But on the flip side, I also get to work with who I want to and when I want to and and so forth. So there's, there's benefits of both. I mean, I would straw, if someone is thinking about doing this and going out consulting, do the legwork, find your, define your ideal client. Who is your ideal client? What is the value proposition? What are their point points? And what are the services that you can map to offer them? If you just come out with an idea of a service and you don't even know who your client is or where to find them, you're not going to be successful. So put that right. foundational work in up front and it will pay off in the long term. Yeah. And it's a journey. You know what, as I'm listening to you, you know, it's alchemy and some people love the sales part of it and have less affinity for the operational part of it and the project management part of it. Yeah. Some people love the execution but to get the execution, you need to sell. To sell, you need to have the operational structure. Yeah. So it's a whole scheme and a whole system that's together. Yeah. And it really is something from nothing. I mean, you had no sales. You had no right. revenue. You had a blank canvas. You might have had a nice frame, but you have to fill that and with possibility and execute it and deploy and have something be realized. Yeah. And, you know, it's where... When you're in a large organization, albeit you get exposed to maybe the operations and sales, you're on the hook for everything. Uh-huh. And it's yeah. double-sided coin. That's the good news. And that's the not good news is that you get yeah. to say who you want to work with, but you got to row that boat. And yeah. um, well, sure. Over- and if you don't row it, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. Right? And sometimes yeah. you need both hands, both feet and an extra uh-huh. set of hands and feet along yeah. the way. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's about understanding your strengths, right? Like I know. My preference is to go to the client work. You know, I'm a, I'm 
I'm a data-driven marketer. Mm -hmm. My happiest place is a spreadsheet and a pivot table. I <laughs> love them. Um, learn them, everybody. That's all I can Columns say. and rows and well, calculations. Oh Data doesn't lie. Data yeah. tells stories. Data gives, tells you the direction to go. So I'm very passionate about data and vivid tables, probably too much so. But that's my happy place. So I have to force myself to work on the other things yeah. because they're important. Yeah. And I also have to learn what I can do and what I can't. So I built my own website, for example. I am as left-brained as they come. Why I thought I could create a beautiful website is beyond me. It took way too long. It turned out fine. It turned, turned out great. Right. Or or design my own logo on Canva. Well, I'm a designer. No, I'm not. I'm a data geek. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, so there are services. There are things that I have learned that when they are not my skill set, and because I'm more valuable when I'm doing the client work, then I outsource it. You know, Fiverr is a great freelance marketplace to design your logo. You know, yeah. so it's about finding the right partners yeah. in the journey as well. In fact, one of my favorite uh, speakers, they're all favorite, gentleman who I, he was the first speaker I ever booked, Tim Sanders, he's at Upwork right now. Yep. He was at Yahoo, C-Level, wrote many bestsellers. His most famous one is Love is the Killer App. And he always told me, guided me, counseled me, cajoled me. He said, if you can afford it and it's not in your wheelhouse, have somebody else do it. Yeah. And, you know, so... That's something that stuck with me early on and I've kind of taken to heart. And while I'm a doer and I could roll up my sleeves and get under the hood, you know, it'll take me literally 50 times longer and the product will be one tenth of quality or, or optimization. Ab optimal, abso so, absolutely. You know? Yeah. And it seems like a simple lesson, but in the spirit of saving money or you want to learn or you want to really take ownership. You know, those things can become justifiers, but in the end, they, they become impediments. Absolutely. You know, you, you know um, my business coach called it the CEO mindset. You need to think like a CEO of a business and operate it like a business. I'm the product, but I'm, I'm a product. And yeah. you know what I mean? There is a yeah. business around exactly. the product. So exactly. I think if you approach it that way and invest accordingly, build a business plan. I remember she said to me, what's your business plan for the year? And I said, I don't know. Why not just start yeah. business? I don't yeah. know what to expect. She's like, would you accept that in your previous role? And I said, right. no. So why is it okay now? And it's so yeah. true. Yeah. But we we're, we're, I don't know if it's overloaded, overwhelmed, or over sensory. There's so many realms and domains operating and the cylinders and yeah. pistons are firing that, you know, you need to have that muscle to be that CEO and be calm in the chaos, be calm in the yeah. storm, choose your battles. And then, you know, deploy out where things can be deployed out. So we're almost at the end, Nicola. It's been a very rich conversation and you've been so generous to be with us and share your insights with us. We get to the point in our conversation in the podcast where we call it 20 questions. It's not literally 20 questions, but it's in the spirit of kind of a rapid fire, rapid response, question and answer type of uh, situation. So are you ready? I'm ready. Bring it on. Okay. What's the most interesting thing about you that we wouldn't learn from your resume? I have narcolepsy. You have narcolepsy. Well, I don't, <laughs> that we've made history. We haven't had any, any, anybody with narcolepsy on the podcast. So ice cream, chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. You had to think about that one. Because strawberries probably plays in there a little bit. I was going to say coffee or mint chocolate yeah. chip. Okay. <laughs> All right. You're allowed. You're allowed. Pizza, traditional clean cheese or toppings? Clean. Clean. You're a woman after my own heart. What is the last book you read? Atomic Habits. Ah, James Clear. It's a popular mm -hmm. one. Yeah, uh -huh. great speaker too. Really great I, message. I made a New Year's resolution to read one business slash self-help book a month. <laughs> that was my only New Year's resolution. I haven't overstretched. <laughs> no, that, you know what, that's a digestible one. And I think that that works, you know, we travel, yeah. we're pulled in a lot of different directions. If you uh, stream or binge, what is it that you're watching or have watched recently? Emily in Paris. Ah, a very, very popular one. Yeah. What's the next place on your travel bucket list? 
Oh, bucket list. I would say I would love to go to Bora Bora. Bora Bora. Uh, we get a lot of that area, Bora Bora and the islands and the beautiful beaches and the clear water. I want to go scuba diving while I'm there. Yeah. What is something you suck at that you would love to be great at? Sales. Sales. <laughs> People are like the cello, you know, or this or that. You're like sales. That That's great. That's great. Three things or three adjectives that your coworkers would describe you as. I would say driven, kind, and fair. Driven, kind, and? Fair. Fair. Yeah, I get that. I get that totally. I think that that's a great place to leave it. I always like to say we've left a little bit on the table to come back and visit again and learn how this journey is unfolded and transformed. Uh, again, I just want to thank you for your generosity of spirit your willingness to give your time and insight to the community and move this conversation forward. There's a lot more that we could have covered and I wanna come back one day and revisit some of those topics that we didn't touch on. To our listeners, thank you for coming back and joining the conversation for our first timers again. We appreciate you being here. We think you're smarter for it and we'll see you next time.